but I am a teacher. And what I want to teach us about today is about seeing the good in all, seeing the good in all. Now, here's a question for you. What, if you're watching online or here in the room, think about this. Do you see the good in all 365, 24-7? If you do, raise your hand. <laughs> Let the record show nobody here in the room raised their hand. <laughs> and I'm not surprised by that because we, you know, it's difficult to truly see the good in every moment of every day as we move through this human experience. There are so many things that are calling our attention that we look at and we say, oh, that's not good. That's not good. And in fact, that's a natural part of our spiritual journey is, is being these human beings and we'll come back to this, that we're ultimately spiritual beings, but we're moving through this human experience. And so let's think about our human experience and, and what it's been like for us in all the years of our life. You know, you were born onto this planet as a, you know, and you're a little baby and you're immediately wanting food and to be cleaned and to have a safe place. And through that, those desires that you had as this little child, you started discovering, ah, food, good. Hunger, not good. Mmm, warmth, good. Cold and, and discomfort, not good. We go through our entire lives actually making these sort of discernments that we've gone through and sort of have this whole category and menu of stuff that we've labeled the good. And then on the other side of the ledger is the not good stuff. And we can take, we can take it from a standpoint of looking through like the, the stomping that we're hearing this building in the moment, we might go, oh, not good, not good. But ultimately, it is good. And we got to be able to shift ourselves into seeing the things that we label as not good, as seeing the good in them. But it's difficult because we've got years and years and years and years of training where we have gone through a ledger in our minds, bringing forth things that we see are good. Having people like me, good. Think about it in, high, in, in school when you went. Having a circle of good friends, good. Being bullied not good. Being alone, not good. We go forward into relationships and the relationships are successful. We feel a sense of love and connection with another person and we call it good. But then the relationship might end and it's not good. And so we continue making those things and we move out into the world and, and we get grades in schools and A's are goods and F's are not goods. And we have our aspect of getting jobs and it pays me a good salary, good. I'm hardly making a living wage, not good. On and on and on. Our entire life has been a pattern of experiences that we have labeled on one spectrum good and on the other spectrum not good. And so we have this whole pattern of two lists, two long lists that we sort of judge through life as we look at stuff and we have a lot of them that are that we've labeled as good and, and a lot of them is not good. And I think we can all sort of identify with that. And we, as we look at it, at, at our list, we also have to recognize that as we've moved through these lives, we create these sort of mental maps about the universe and the world in which we live. We say, here's how the world works. And I want these good things I've put on the good ledger. And if I do these things, in my life and act in this certain way, I'm going to get the things that are good. As I have defined my life with my mental map, my mental map also steers me away from those things that are not good. And so we have a lot of, a lot of map making going on in our heads, whether we recognize it or not. We have a vision of how the world works, why are we here, what's the meaning of life, and what's good and what's not good. And so we have these maps and we walk around each day with them and they're driving our actions and our decisions. And as we do that, we also get urges, urges to learn and to explore more. Now here you are, you've come to a, a science of mind center, a center for spiritual living. You're pursuing a spiritual philosophy and you walk in the door and as you discover the philosophy when you first are learning about it, you have come in with this list of the good and list of the not good. And when you come in, you're also trying to explore more about your mental maps and the meaning of life. And as you approach science of mind and you find that, you know, if you keep coming and you find that it resonates with you, that the philosophy resonates with you, one of the first things about the, the philosophy that you hear about is that the universe is good 
and there is an infinite variety of good for you and that you can have the good. And there are techniques and approaches and ways in which you can live your life to manifest more of the good. And you hear that and you go, good, good, because I want to have more of the stuff I've labeled the good. I want to have the big job, the big car, the stuff. I want to have the relationships. I want to have the ability to express my creative sparks and talents. All of that's on my good ledger. And so science of mind and new thought offers the idea that you can have that good and offers techniques for developing it. But you also come in and you approach this philosophy and they hit you with something else. They hit you with this idea that everything is God and everything is good. Wait a minute. I got a whole ledger of not good stuff that I've walked in the door with. And I got to all of a sudden reconcile my not good list with a message of a philosophy that says everything is good and that the goal of our life is to see the good in all? Oh, well, let's just hold that. Let's go back to this other side, this other thing you were talking about. How do I get more good in my life? And so we start giving you the tools and techniques. And I sort of call this the introductory metaphysical lessons of science of mind. It's really the base stuff that when people come in the door, their perspective is, I'm Mark. I have this good list and my not good list, and I want more of the good. And you have got techniques for me. And they say, yes, Mark, come here. Change your thinking, and you can change your life. Focus more on seeing goodness in your life, and you see more goodness in your life. Those things that are on the not good list, if you push against them, you're going to see more of the not good. There's the old saying, what you resist persists. So what we push against and deny and don't want in our life are not good list. If we focus on those, so the whole thing is teach your mind to think more over here on the good side and think less over here on the bad side and you will manifest more of the good. And it works, it works. If you truly practice this, you will find that you have more and more goodness coming into your life by focusing on this. But there's that other thing we teach that's over here. And that's the advanced metaphysics stuff. That's a little more challenging when we get into it. A little more challenging because it says everything is God. And everything is good. And I've got to somehow or another take the things that have been on my not good list and the things I'm currently putting on the not good list. Just look at the world out there. War, fighting, divisiveness, pol political systems that are stuck. I could go on and on and on with a big not appearance of not, not good over here. And I've got to somehow or another see the good and all of that, and call it God and spirit, and see it's all part of the oneness? How the heck do I get there? It's comfortable to be over here and use the tools of new thought and science of mind to create our life as an individual and see the good in our life. But we're also called on a spiritual journey to expand our consciousness, to rise, to move from the physical being and human being to the spiritual being, which takes us into the advanced metaphysics and which takes me into the thing that every time you invite me back here, I always give you the same sort of message. I say the same kind of words at some point in the talk that you almost come to expect it. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. We live simultaneously in two worlds. We have a world of form and the physical body and our lives that with our names and all of our stories but we're beyond that. We're spiritual beings that live in a world of oneness and unity and, com and completeness. And as the theme for the month is wholeness, that's where wholeness rests. Wholeness rests in the sense that everything is whole and complete in and of itself. And I have to move from this perspective of me, Mark, as an individual, satisfying my individual needs by using the tools of science of mine, to being this being that is anchored in oneness. I, I, I lately have been describing it. It's like you're on a, a continuum. 
And I think this is a good model for your mental map, that we live on a graduated scale where at one end is the material physical world with the lowest levels of consciousness. You can think rocks and minerals if it helps you. But on the other end is the vast expansiveness of that mystical feeling of oneness and completeness of all that is. And we live in between, moving around, more on the end towards the rocks many days than up there in the vast blissness of oneness. But if that's where we see everything is God and everything is good. It's down here next to the rocks where we say good, not good, good, not good. Because it's in our individual lives we've made these discernments and it's good for us to employ that in that aspect of our life. I don't want to diss it. Making those discernments in our lives are an important part of living the human journey. But on the spiritual journey, at some point, we have to move beyond that and expand our ideas of what's really, truly good. So the question then becomes, how do I move up this continuum? I mean, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a gradual process. You know, some people have these moments of spiritual enlightenment and can jump up there, but that's not most of us. Most of us gradually, slowly turn our attention and focus in the direction of the divine. It's a building a spiritual muscle of continuously moving in that direction. How do we do build that spiritual muscle? It's coming to centers like this and discussing spiritual concepts and exploring the idea of spirituality and unity. It's part of it is meditation. Part of it is affirmative prayer. Part of it is trying to expand your consciousness beyond the sense of you being an individual to being a part of a unity and a whole. Yes, meditation helps. Yes, spiritual tools help. And slowly over time, when you can look back at your life from here to a month ago to a year ago, if you continuously employ the tools, you will see you are slowly moving up in vibratory level to new vibrations of consciousness where you are sensing a greater sense of unity and interconnectedness of everything. Now, I want to talk about another tool, another way in which you can move up this continuum. Because ultimately it's up there that you're going to have the degree of consciousness that allows you to see that all is good and all is God. How do you get there? Well, we've been talking about it in terms of spiritual practices and meditation and things like that. But I want to call you to see that there's another tool you can use, and that is the ability to shift your perspective. Shift your perspective. Now, there's an old story that, that we've heard uh, probably many times in many, many uh, different settings and many spiritual teachers like to use. It's called the, the story of the Chinese farmer. And you've probably heard the story, but let's give, give you a quick telling of it, one version of it. In ancient days in China, there was a, a farmer who farmed his field and took care of his family, and he had one horse, and he had one son who supported him in his farming. And then one day, his son left the gate open, and the horse ran away. And his neighbors came to him, and to the old farmer, and they said, oh, this is so bad. You have lost the horse that you needed for plowing your fields and and, and harvesting your crops. What are you going to do now? This is just terrible. And the old farmer looked at him and he said, maybe, maybe not. And the next day, the horse came back and it brought with it six wild horses. And the son was able to close the gate and they collected it and all of a sudden they've got not only one horse, they've got six, seven horses, doing my math. And the neighbors came to the old farmer and they said, wow, how good life is for you. You've now got seven horses to help you plow your field and grow your crops. And the old farmer says, maybe, maybe not. So the next day, the son's out there trying to break one of the wild horses to get it so they can use it. And he falls off the horse and breaks his leg. Now he's not able to help with harvesting the crops. The neighbors come to the old farmer and they say, wow, you must be devastated. The sole support you've got for helping with the farm has broken his leg and can't help you. And the old farmer turns to him and he says, maybe, maybe not. The next day, the king sends out his emissaries to get young men to come to help fight a war. A war where they're drawing on all the young men to, to, to go off into battle in something that's known that many and many of them are going to lose their lives. 
And as they come to the village, here is this young man who normally would be taken because his leg was broken. The army passed him by. And the old neighbors came to the farmer and they said, wow, you must feel blessed that the army did not take your son away to war. And he said, maybe, maybe not. Now, the story could go on from there, but I think you get the point is that anytime we judge something, we judge it from this perspective of our lives. We look out at stuff and we say, in this scenario with the setting of what just happened, I put that in the good column or the not good column. And that's my perspective on it. But what this story calls us to see is to shift perspectives, to see it from a bigger standpoint, to see it from a longer time standpoint, to see it from more than just the individuals, but from a society or human standpoint. So there's a real challenge for us to shift away from being, I'm Mark, with this is my story and this is my life and my list of good and not good, to shifting my perspective to thinking and putting myself into the perspective of others. There, the New Thought teacher Neville Goddard stated that one of the greatest gifts that humans were given was the ability to have an active imagination. An active imagination. That allows us to create in our own th minds, our own awareness, the thoughts about what something might be look look like and be. Now we use that imagination for the create, creation of our lives and the new th news that we're bring, bringing into our lives. But we can also use our imaginations to imagine what it would be like to be another person. Now I want to just talk us through for and think for just a few minutes about how we can look at what other perspectives are we talking about. And I first want to put this on the easiest way, and it's, I won't say it's, it's uh, easy, but it's easy to think about, and that is the, the fact that we live on sort of a horizontal aspect with a bunch of other people. We can look around sideways horizontally and we see all these other people and we sort of imagine what it's like to be inside the, the awareness of other people, but we really don't know. We, make, we, we know from our interactions that it seems like you're having a similar experience to me, but I really don't know what it's like to be you. But I can imagine. I can take my imagination and say, okay, this scenario might be good or not good for me, but what is it for you? And what is it for you? And in my imagination, as I start looking at other individual people, expanding my perspective out to be multiple individual people, I start having a bigger perspective in what's good and not good. And I can see that some of the things that I put in my not good column might actually be good for other people and vice versa, but that's okay. What I'm starting to see though, is that the key thing is that I labeled it not good, but another aspect of the one you might label it and see it as good. And I've got to be okay with the fact that's good for you. And see that in terms of the oneness and the unity of all of us, if I can shift and imagine what it's like for you. And then I can take that to groups of people. Again, we're looking horizontally in human beings. We're taking this out to these human beings, having these human experiences, and we're imagining, is this good or not good for them? And the more I can do that, the more I can expand my awareness out to, to imagine the aspect that's seen from bigger and longer time spans, from bigger groups of human beings, that the stories and things that I've put in my not good column might actually be good for someone. And I didn't label it good to begin with. So that's the horizontally, now that's, that's tough to do. But if we can expand our perspectives to understand the motives and desires and the mental maps that everyone else has and carries around with them and can put ourselves in our imagination in their shoes, then all of a sudden it opens us to compassion. The person who cuts us off on the freeway or in the road, you know, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're on the way to the hospital. Maybe there is something that is, that it's good that I'm letting them go on and not making gestures at them. Maybe it's anyone who is doing something that is, that is I'm determining is less than. Maybe there is a good reason. Now, if I use my imagination, I can probably plug that in. Even if it's not true, it allows me to bless the person and, and stay united with them without me feeling anger and upsetness and, and creating more divisiveness. So the more I can expand my awareness in human, the more I can take their perspectives, then the more I can expand myself to seeing the good and all. But there's another axis I want us to look at. So you sort of like think about an X, like a cross, 
the horizontal perspective as we're trying to imagine the perspectives of other humans. But there's other perspectives going on we don't often think about. This body that stands before you is made up of molecules and cells and all kinds of aspects of things, and in it is consciousness. Every aspect of my physical form contains consciousness within it. I've got within me thousands and millions of cells that know what they're doing, they know what's good for them, and they know what's not good for them. they got their own good and not good list going on inside me. And they're maintaining my body. And they're maintaining your body. And they're maintaining the, the, the forms in this world, that there are all these things that have consciousness within them that are, that are maintaining their aspects. of. So can I change my perspective and imagine myself within my body for a moment? Can I imagine myself as a blood cell or an aspect of, of a cell who has been threatened by a virus and is now the virus bad, <laughs> not good? The cell reacts to it, produces antibodies and fights it with my immune system, good. The fact that I'm sick may seem not good, but seen from the perspective of the cells within my body, maybe it, the things that are going on there, that natural tension between the states of illness and, and wellness and the natural defenses of my body, maybe there's goodness going on. Can I see the good in that? Can I take the perspective of the small? Okay. So it's, it's trying to see there's goodness going on in every aspect, not just in humans, but in the things that make up this world of form. But I said it's an X, and there's the part below us, there's the part above us. This is a little bit tougher, but what's above us? What's above us? Higher dimensions of consciousness, multiple dimensions, understanding spirit at a deep and, and, and wonderful level, mystical experiences. There are realms and areas of consciousness above us that we can hardly imagine. But can we imagine? Can we imagine? We've been given the gift, as Neville says, of creative imaginations. And we can imagine that there is realms and lives above us. And can we in the moment imagine that? Can we take the perspective of something greater and grander than my humanness and the human story? So what are we doing? What am I trying to get you to, to do here? It sounds kind of weird in a way, I get it. But I'm trying to get you to say, hey, the more we stay stuck in seeing life only from the aspect of myself as an individual human, having my, yes, I'm having a spirit, I'm a spiritual being, having a human experience, but as long as my identity and my, my, my perspective is locked as me, Mark, my life, I'm not experiencing it's hard for me to see the good in all. But if I could take that perspective and apply it to humanity, starting small, people around me, move it up, move it up, move it up, it's more and more and more. See humanity as a total. And, and can I take it to look at this, this physical universe and all the smallness and the things that are building up within this? Can I expand it to the realms and dimensions beyond me? Can I take it to the vastness of the all, of everything that is potentially possible in this world? Can I bring my consciousness to that level? Where are we going? Where are we going? We're going to God. We're going to spirit. We're going, we're going to something that's so far beyond us that it's difficult for us sometimes to wrap our minds. It's comfortable to be in my body. But this unknown, nebulous oneness, it's a little scary in a way. But if we truly want to live in a state of wholeness, if we truly want to see the good, in all, if we want to honor the spiritual path we're on and to take the next steps of where we're called to be, at some point we have to let go. Hold on to my humanness and my story for my interactions in this world, but don't see it as my entire story. Use it for your interactions in this world, but to know that your ultimate truth expands beyond this world. And if you can take the, using your imagination, the perspective of other people and the smallness of cells and put yourself into the life of a rock or a dog or into angels and mystical beings beyond this realm, if you can, in your imagination, 
move about. But all of a sudden, you see that the things that are the human stories and all the things that we have put into the column called not good, they're really serving good. The whole human spiritual story is about us being cast out from oneness, going through our human story and returning to oneness. And so a part of that story is this discernment between good and not good while we're here. But a part of our story is that as we return to oneness and recognize that all those goods and not goods, they were all good. They were all good. They all served where we're going. The job loss that led you to a new career. The relationship that ended that led you to a new relationship. The questioning of a faith and belief and worldview that led you to a new one. There's always the release of something for the newness to birth in your evolution. Let's allow ourselves to expand our perspective, to take the perspective of the all. Start where you are. That's what we did when we started with the techniques of changing your thinking. We had to start where we are. But wherever you are in your perspective of oneness and unity of the universe, start there and begin each day meditating, making affirmations, setting the attention to live in oneness, and to begin taking the perspective of others to open your heart to compassion. And as you do that, you'll find that in time, as you look back on your life a week later, a month later, a year later, sometimes 20 years later, you'll discover that you have become enlightened, enlightened to the truth that everything is God and everything is good.